The third commandment says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have you been breaking that important commandment? The Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and we're in a series on the Ten Commandments written in stone. And today's message is titled, Hallowed Be Thy Name. a woman, this was years and years ago, a woman, a very powerful, wealthy woman of means and social prominence, and she wanted to have a book written about her life and about her history and about her genealogy. So she hired this man to write her story and to research her family, and the man uh, came back to her after some time and said, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but there's, a, there's some bad things in, in your family's history. And she said, what? She's, he said, you have a great-grandfather who was uh, sent to prison at Sing Sing for being a murderer, and he was electrocuted in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison in New York. She said, that's horrible. I didn't know that. She said, uh, well, you can't write that. Uh, in my story because that would sully my good name knowing that I had a great-grandfather like that. She said, you need to come up with something else to tell that story. So this is what he wrote in her book. One of her great-grandfathers occupied the chair of applied electricity in one of America's best-known institutions. He was very much attached to his position and literally died in the harness. <laughs> she went to great lengths to protect her name. The Bible says, Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is more desired than great riches. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7, 1, a good name is better than expensive perfume. So let me ask you, do you have a good name, a good reputation at school, in the community, at work, in the church? Do you have a good name? Do people associate your name with godliness, with honesty and integrity, with responsibility, with trustworthiness? You know, when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray, Jesus said, pray them in, in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy be your name, as the easy-to-read version translates that. Lord, we pray that your name will always be kept holy. Hallowed means holy. Now, that's how the Lord told them, when you pray, now, it's not, a, it's not a prayer that we're to recite necessarily, it's a model prayer. But the very first thing in the model prayer is, hallowed be thy name. This was not a new concept that Jesus was giving his disciples. This was something that was written in stone. It's the third commandment that God's name, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, I was listening this week to some sermons by Bodie Bauckham. He's done a series called the, the Laws of Worship, and in, or the Law of Worship. And in the Law of Worship, he takes the first four commandments, uh, you know, two, two tablets of stone. You have uh, vertical commandments on one tablet, the first four, and then horizontal commandments on the second tablet that uh, are, deal with uh, commandments 5 through 10 that deal with man to man. But the first four are us with God. And I like what he says about them. He says, uh, the first commandment, we worship God only. 
The second commandment, we worship God rightly. The third commandment, we worship God reverently. And the fourth commandment, we worship God regularly. Those are the first four, the vertical uh, direction of the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments. So in our study, written in stone, we're going to look at commandment number three. And just to give us a uh, uh, background and a running start, we're going to start Exodus 20 and verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number one. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Commandment number three, you shall not... Take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Commandment number three is so important. Now, they're all connected because, as Vodi Bakum said, the first four are all vertical and they all are connected in the worship of God. But commandment number three, of all the Ten Commandments, it's the only commandment that has expressly uh, written in it, this is what happens if you break this commandment. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, it's not a minor thing, a trivial thing, an incidental thing to break the third commandment. And I dare say everyone in this room, everyone under the sound of my voice has broken the third commandment. Oh, it's no big deal. It's a really big deal. And we're going to discover why it is such a big deal today. So, what's the big deal about it? Why does God seem to get so upset about it? Two insights for this morning. Number one, God's name represents all His goodness and all His glory. His character, His nature, His splendor, everything is wrapped up in His name. Now, as you read the Bible, you'll find, especially in the Old Testament, you'll find that God has many names. I mean, we read about different names for God, and somebody has said there's 102 different names for God. Well, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, Elohim in the Hebrew, Elohim. Uh, created the heavens and the earth. That's the first name we run into. El, is a, it's a compound word. El means might and power, and Ohim means uh, to keep a vow. Right in the very first verse of the Bible, we run into the God who has all might and all power and who always keeps His word, Elohim. And uh, we have other El names of God in the Scripture. We have El Roi, one of my favorite names for God, the God who sees me, Genesis chapter 16. We have El Elyon, God Most High. We have the song that Amy Grant made very popular, the name uh, of God, El Shaddai, the, the overpower, or the mighty God. So a lot of El names for God, and it just gives us, it's like looking at a diamond. You just turn it a little a bit, and you get a different uh, sense of its splendor, a different angle and viewpoint of its splendor. That's why God gives us so many names, because God is so infinite that our minds can't comprehend God just in one shot. Well, you run into Isaiah 6, the prophecy of uh, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, the prophecy of Jesus. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All those names given to the Lord Jesus Christ 700 years before he ever came on the scene as far as walking this earth. And then you have the personal name of God, the, the covenant name of God, and that's in four letters, Y-H-W-H. We don't really know definitively how to pronounce that name. 
See, the Hebrew alphabet or the, the Hebrew language didn't have vowels. It's really difficult to pronounce words that don't have vowels. And so you take the, the Hebrew yod, he, vav, he, y, h, w, h, and they used to pronounce it. it. It's given in Scripture in the Old Testament 6,500 times, 6,500 and some change. It's used over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture. That's the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when Moses said, Lord, what, what should I say? What's your name? I don't know your name. What the children of Israel are going to ask me, well, what is his name? What should I say to them? You tell them I am sent you. I am who I am. And that word I am is the four letters called in theological circles the tetra, meaning four, tetragrammaton, the four letters. And we, the best we can come up with is Y-H-W-H is Yahweh. Now, about the time of the Reformation in the 1500s, they took the four letters, Y-H-W-H, and they Latinized them, and they, they translated those four letters into Latin, and then from the Latin, they pronounced them with the German pronunciation. So Y-H-W-H became J-H-V-H, and we know that name as Jehovah. Yahovah, Jehovah. And so we have all these Jehovah names. If you grew up in the church, you know about these Jehovah names. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord ever present. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And so whether you call him Jehovah or whether you want to get probably more technically correct, Yahweh, that's the special name of God. That's the name that's used over and over and over again, and that's the name that's used with other names. Now, in Exodus chapter 20, it's used as Yahweh, your Elohim. Elohim, the God of might and power, the God who always keeps His Word. Yahweh, the personal name of God, the I Am, the self-existent one. And so, God is very, very interested and committed to his name and the holiness of his name. That's high, high, high on his list. I'm going to carve 10 words, 10 commandments into stone, and that's one of the commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God, Yahweh, your Elohim, in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. His name represents all that he is, all his goodness and majesty and glory and grace. You say, well, where do you get that, that his name represents all that? I'm glad you asked. Exodus chapter 33. Moses says to the Lord, Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, I pray, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Your glory, your goodness is in the name. In the name. That's Exodus 33. And what happens in Exodus 34? He hides Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he covers him with his hand, and he says, Moses, you can't see my face. No man can see my face and live. I'm going to show you the backside of my glory. I'm going to show you the edges of my glory. I'm going to show you the, the afterglow of my glory, so to speak. And this is what the Lord said when he passed by. The Lord, the Lord, God, Yahweh, Yahweh, El just the shortened version of God, L. This is my name, and this is who I am, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And when Moses had that encounter with God, he made haste to get low and worship God. His name encompasses all of who he is. Now, let me ask you, 
when you think of the name of God and who He is? Do you ever read Scripture and say, well, I like this aspect of God's character, but I don't like that aspect of God's character? Some people say, well, you know, I don't like the idea that God judges. I don't like the idea that there's a hell and that people could actually end up in hell. I don't like the idea that uh, there's a great white throne judgment where the Lord says, depart from me, all you who practice lawlessness. I, I, don't, I don't like the, the idea of that. Well, so what? Who cares what you like? God is God. Remember what I've told you? God is is not who you want him to be. He is who he is. And when you have people who say, well, I like this about God, but I don't like that about God, and so I'm throwing out the things I don't like about God, well, then you've created another God. As it says in 1 Corinthians, uh, they had another Jesus in whom we have not preached. Just because somebody uses the name of God, somebody uses the name of Jesus, doesn't mean it's the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the cultist is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the liberal is not the Jesus of the Bible. They create another Jesus whom we have not preached. They create another God. And you might be guilty of that, creating another God in your own imagination. If you have done that, you've broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You've broken the second commandment because you've created an idol. You've created a God who doesn't exist. God is who he is. And when we read things about God that we say, man, I mean, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by raining down fire and brimstone, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. Well, that just sure doesn't sound like God. It does sound like God. It is God. And you need to know about God, the fullness of who He is. Well, His name represents that. All His goodness, all His glory, all His grace, all His splendor, everything is wrapped up in His name. That's the first insight. And second insight, God's name is to be feared and revered far above all other names. The Lord has bestowed on Jesus the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you, know, you want to know something that's so cool? So, in the Old Testament, you have the special name of God, and if you have a Bible like mine, New American Standard, anytime you run into the four letters, Y-H-W-H, it's always capitalized, L-O-R-D, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and it's to let you know that that's the name. That's the name. And use 6,500 times, 6,519, I think, Lord, Yahweh. It's not used once in the New Testament, Y-H-W-H. You say, why is that not used once in the New Testament? Because the name that's used in the New Testament is Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. And the name Jesus means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. We read about Yahweh in the Old Testament, and we see Yahweh in the New Testament. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now, the last book in the Old Testament, they were breaking the third commandment in such a horrible way. This is what the Lord says to them. The priests, it was especially in the ministry, it was rotten and it was polluting the people. And the Lord says, for from the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts, says Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of angel armies. And then he goes on to say, but cursed be the swindler who is a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be 
feared. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Holy and awesome, Psalm 111 says, holy and awesome is his name. And in Malachi's day, they were profaning the name. They were breaking the third commandment. Have you broken the third commandment? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So let's look at that in the Hebrew. You shall not take. We kind of interpret the word take to mean speak. You shall not speak the name of the Lord in vain. But the word take means a whole lot more than just speak. The word take literally means to bear, to carry, to lift up. You shall not bear the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not lift up the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not carry the name of the Lord in vain. In vain means emptiness, nothingness, falsehood, worthlessness. Now, I want to share with you five ways that people take the name of the Lord, their God, in vain. How Christians Take the name of the Lord, our God, in vain. It is horrible, but it definitely happens. So, first way, we take his name in vain when we use it flippantly, when we use it lightly, when we use it mindlessly. You know, to be flippant means you lack proper respect. Hey, when we take God's name in vain, it happens when we use it flippantly and lightly. We, we text a friend, and what do we use? Those three letters, OMG. Everybody knows what that means. And those that are trying to cover their tracks, they say, well, I mean gosh. Well, what does gosh stand for? Oh, well, it's my way of not saying God. Yeah, we just use it. We use that, the, the name of God as an interjection. You say, what's an interjection? It's just something that you say. It's just mindless. Somebody tells you a story. Oh, man, that's something. The oh, man is an interjection. Oh, wow, that's cool. That's an interjection. it's, It's words that don't necessarily have some tremendous meaning to them. You just use it. Wow, cool, neat. Ew. That's an interjection. And we use God's name that way. The, the name that is above all names, we use it flippantly. Hey, you know, you can sing a hymn or a, a praise song, and if you're not engaged with what you're singing and you're singing about God's name and your mind is a million miles away, you've broken the third commandment because you're mindless in speaking the name. And people say, well, you know, Jeff, it don't get all bent out of shape. I don't mean anything by it. Uh, you probably don't. That's what in vain means. It means you're not thinking about it. You're, you're mindless. It, it doesn't mean anything to you. And so we break the third commandment and take his name in vain when we use it flippantly, lightly, mindlessly. How about number two? We take his name in vain when we use it contemptibly contemptibly. You say, that's a big word. What does that mean? Well, I had to look it up. Uh, It means deserving scorn, that which is despicable. You know, in, in a court of law, they can hold you in contempt. And we use the name, so many of us, we use it contemptibly. We use it as an expletive. We use it as a swear word. We take God's name and we add damn to the end of his name. We take the name of Jesus who died in agony and blood for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world. We take the precious name of Jesus who spoke the worlds into existence. Universes just drip off his fingertips and we take his name and we run it through the muck and the mire and the slime of the sewer. We think nothing of it. We think that that punctuates our point. I like what one person said, what is profanity? It's the attempt of a feeble mind to express itself forcibly. 
Oh, look how tough I am because I use this salty language. I had a friend of mine, he used to say, use uh, profanity, and then he'd say, well, uh, pardon my French. I said, hey, I took French in school. That's not French. You're, you're swearing, and you're using God's name in a contemptible fashion. That's taking his name in vain. Many remember when Richard Nixon had to resign from the office of president in shame because he had done something terrible with Watergate, and then it was discovered that he had all these tapes, the Nixon tapes. What was on the tapes? Well, it was revealed what was on the tapes, and this man, president from 1969 to 1974, he had tapes, and then on the tapes he would take God's name in vain. He would use it contemptibly. He would add damn to God's name. Billy Graham was a good friend of President Richard Nixon. He said, when I heard what was on those tapes, I felt physically sick. He said, never did Richard Nixon talk like that in my presence. I was shocked to hear what was on those tapes. Hey, how do you talk? You know, a lot of people, when they talk to me, they'll really clean it up. Well, I'm talking to the pastor. I got I to watch what I say. But then you hear them talk when they don't know you're around, and you find out what's really in their hearts. Hey, how, how do, what does it do to you when you hear somebody Take the name of your Savior and run it through the, mudder, uh, the, the mud and the gutter. What, is, what does it do to you? Does it bother you at all? You know, we watch, we watch shows and movies on television. It's very hard to find something that is clean today. But we watch those things. We don't think anything of it, of all the profanity in there and how they take the name of the Lord and, and run it through the mud. We think, oh, well. Hey, listen. You can't allow that stuff to go in your ears without it finding a place in your heart. I, one of my good friends who discipled me, he said when I first got out of uh, Texas, University of Texas, he had my first job. He was a bank examiner, and he said I was around all these people, and they cussed all the time. And he said it was starting to, I was hearing it all the time, and it was starting to get down in my heart. And he said as I would work and things would happen that would be frustrating, he said I would think cuss words. He said, I wouldn't say them, but I would think them. Now, he's thinking just uh, garden variety cuss words. He wasn't thinking about taking the name of the Lord and running it through the dirt. But we listen to people do that. What, what does it do to your mind, your heart, your soul when you hear the name of Jesus maligned like that? Does it bother you? It should bother you. You know, I, I, I question when a person says he's a Christian, she's a Christian, and can talk that way and can say those things about the Lord with such contempt, I really question, have you ever really been saved? How, how could you talk about the Savior that way? That he must not be your Savior. Because, see, for a Christian, when someone takes the name of God and runs it into the dirt, that bothers you. I did a funeral over Christmas for a dear friend, I'd known her for a long, long time, almost 50 years, Alice Ann Wagner. She was a wonderful, she and her husband, Howard, wonderful supporters of From His Heart Ministries. I went to high school, middle school and high school with their youngest son, Scott, and he and I spent a lot of time together. We played basketball together. We had a great relationship. And so I was honored to do the funeral for Alice Ann Wagner. And uh, the middle brother, Kevin, he was uh, athletic, worked in athletics at uh, Louisiana State University for years, just recently retired. He got up and shared about his mom, and he said, I'll never forget. He said, I was in middle school. I was playing basketball. He said, the coach didn't like me. And he said, I was playing, and my parents would always come to the games, and they would sit just two or three rows behind the bench. And he said, I made a bad pass. I turned the ball over. And the coach got up and yelled and said, Wagner, you're so stupid. And he said, my mom heard that. And she stood up, 
And she yelled so everybody in the gym could hear, don't you ever call my son stupid. That's my son. How about when they do that to your Savior? That should get all over you and all over me. I still remember a story I heard years ago about an old Christian, saint of God. He was at Royal Albert Hall in London, and he was there for a concert, and they were singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And he thought about what Jesus had done for him. And the tears just began to roll down his cheeks as he thought about how much he loved the Lord for what he did for him. And he said, a person sitting next to him, he didn't know them, they didn't know him. They looked over at him like, what is wrong with you? And that man said, oh, I must look ridiculous to this person. And then he thought, I don't care. And he turned to that person and he said, that's my Savior they're singing about. That's my Savior that they're singing about. Hey, we take the name of the Lord in vain when we use it flippantly, when we use it contemptibly. Thirdly, when we use it dishonestly, we take his name in vain. We use it in a false way. We use it in a dishonest way. You say, what do you mean? Leviticus 19.12, you shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Don't use my name in any kind of an oath and swear falsely. Jeremiah 5, verse 2, the people make promises and say, as the Lord lives, but they don't really mean it. As the Lord lives would be like our way of saying, uh, I swear to God, but they don't really mean it. And we take God's name in vain when we use it falsely, dishonestly. You say, well, who does that? People who get married, they make vows, and they say, I promise to love you. I promise to honor you. I promise to cherish you. I promise to be to you a true and faithful spouse as long as we both shall live. And then they're not true, and they're not faithful, and they bail out. Now, there are reasons and exceptions to divorce that the Lord gives us. Continued adultery is an exception. You can divorce in that situation. Abandonment, you can divorce in that situation. I think that abuse, you could put that in there just based on the character and nature of God. He didn't call anybody to be a punching bag uh, in marriage. But lots of people divorce for what reason? Irreconcilable differences. We should have thought about that before you got married. Figure that out before you get married. Now, I've had people over the years tell me, they said, well, you know, when we do our wedding, Pastor Jeff, we do do our wedding, but, but we want to do our own vows. I said, that's fine. You can do your own vows, but you're going to do my vows too because I don't know what your vows are, but I know what I'm going to have you say, and it's going to be a vow before God and these assembled witnesses, and it's in the name of the Lord Jesus. Don't swear falsely in the name of God. When we use that dishonestly and you share false, swear falsely by his name, you profane it. And that is taking his name in vain. Fourthly, we take his name in vain when we bear it dishonestly. See, it's not just what comes out of your mouth. It's how you live. And the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they, didn't, they wouldn't use God's name in a flippant manner or in a contemptible manner, but they bore his name in such a dishonorable way. And see, for them, it was all just external. It was all outward and it wasn't inward. Now, remember, when it says, you shall not take, take the name of the Lord, that means to carry, to bear, to lift up. You shall not carry the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not bear the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not lift it up in vain. You shall bear, and as believers in Jesus, we bear his name. We're the people of God called by his name. 
We are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we bear his name. We belong to him. As the Bible says, oh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. And so, as Paul prayed in Colossians chapter 1, he said, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Hey, how are we to live as Christians? We bear the name. We belong to him. And we're to walk in a worthy manner because we bear the name. I remember what Adrian Rogers used to tell his kids when he would take them to school. He would, before they got out of the car, he'd say, now you remember who you are and you remember whose you are. Hey, you, you represent the name. I, I love what George Foreman, when I interviewed George Foreman just recently, you know, he named all his boys George. So it's George Foreman and, and six or seven boys named George. George the first, George the second, George the second. It's all these Georges. And they said, why do you, George, why would you name your kids George? He, because, he said, because if one of my boys does something good, he lifts us all up. And if one does something bad, he pulls us all down. So there would be accountability in the name. We bear the name Christian, a Christ follower. How you doing honoring the name? Jesus said to the Pharisees, you guys honor me with your lips, but your heart is far away from me, but in vain do you worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. There's that vain word again. You, you're, you're saying the right things. You honor me with your lips, but where's your heart? Your heart's far away from me. And see, commandment number three is not something that is just on paper. It's not something that's external. It's not like, well, I never use the name of God that way. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't say God's name in vain. It doesn't come out of my mouth like that. Well, how are you living? You know, the, the Pharisees, like I said, they didn't take God's name in vain. They didn't speak it in vain. They lived it in vain because it wasn't real in their hearts. They didn't honor God. Jesus said, I honor my father to the Pharisees, John chapter 8. I honor my father, and you dishonor me. We have lots of Christians. Well, they don't think a whole lot about the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Remember the seventh commandment? These two are together not with these others over here. Remember, we learned that in the sign language of the Ten Commandments. But we don't think a whole lot about that. Well, it doesn't really matter how I live. And so we go on vacation. I had a lady tell me one time, this was way back when, she went on a vacation with her, uh, with her boyfriend. I say a lady, she was my sister, my youngest sister. And uh, I said, uh, wait a minute, you're going on a vacation with your boyfriend, you, you guys aren't married. Oh, you staying in one hotel room, he's staying in another? She goes, Jeff, it's the 80s. Oh, it's like, ah, silly me. I didn't know that there was a shelf life on God's commandment to not commit adultery. That goes until the end of time. The moral law of God never changes. And if we're living a life that is displeasing to God, hey, you know what? You bear the name of Jesus, and you're taking the name of Jesus, and you're taking it as to mean nothing, to be meaningless, to be empty and false and worthless. Gandhi said this, I would have become a Christian had it not been for all the Christians that I had known. Romans chapter 2 Verses 23 and 24 says this, You boast in the law 
Through your, boast, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because, because of you, just as it is written. That's quoting from 2 Samuel chapter 12 when Nathan the prophet went to David and confronted David with his sin with Bathsheba and said, he said to him, because you have done this, King David, you've given occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme God. They say, ah, you know, this, this God stuff must not mean anything if that's the way his followers act. Serious business when we bear it dishonorably. And then lastly, we take his name in vain when we fail to take him seriously. You shall not... Take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. My name is feared among the nations, God says. And you have the audacity to take it in vain as if it's meaningly, meaningless, as if it's nothing, as if it's worthless. The majestic name of Yahweh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I had a situation with an older gentleman, and he always took the Lord's name in vain, and I was a young Christian, and it just went all over me. And I said, why do you always take the Lord's name in vain and use it in such a contemptible way? He said, he said it makes me feel better. He said, I think God is for me taking his name in vain. I said, oh, really? I said, do you know the third commandment? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He said, yeah, I know that. I said, do you know the rest of it? He said, no, what's the rest of it? I said, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. He said, oh. He didn't know that that was in there. Yeah, that's in there. But see, we become oblivious, and we don't take God seriously, and we say, well, I mean, God, is, he's not very upset about that. That's a minor thing. I'm surprised that even made it onto the tablets of stone. This is what was in the law for the Jews in their civil law, Leviticus 24. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, if anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord, Yahweh, shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Serious business to take God's name, to bear God's name, to lift up God's name in a worthless, meaningless, vain manner. So, you think about it and you say, good grief, I'm guilty of breaking the third commandment. I I'm hearing you, Pastor Jeff, and I'm guilty of breaking the third commandment. You know what, Pastor Jeff? You're going to be so happy with me. I'm going to do better. Listen, I learned from my dear friend, Dr. Wayne McDill, you never preach for people to do better better. You preach for people to trust God, for people to look to God, for people to cry out and say, Lord, I'm guilty. Lord, help me. Lord, change my situation. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May it be like you. You know, the Lord says to us, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. You shall be holy for I am holy. And you need to honor me in the way you live. You need to honor me in the way you talk. You need to quit being like the world and quit compromising with the world and do a serious check on what you're allowing to go in your ears, to go through your eyes that's polluting you because you belong to me. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I love how... The Lord commanded Moses through Aaron to bless the people 
Numbers chapter 6, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons saying, thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace so they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and I then will bless them, my name. Wouldn't it be wonderful? You're here and you say, uh, you know, Pastor Jeff, I, I know the name of the Lord. I know about him. I know things about him. I know Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I know that he is God in the flesh. But like so many people, you have that in your head. It's just facts in your head. You know who else believes all those things? The devil. The demons believe and tremble. That doesn't save you believing facts about Jesus in your head. What saves you is when you come to Jesus with a broken heart and you put your faith and trust in him. When faith goes from your mind to your heart. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you shall find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You have to come to him. You have to say yes to him. And when you come to him and say yes to him, you become his very own. It was in 2019, I believe September of 2019, when I got a phone call from a young man who was courting my middle daughter, Travis Van Hoy. Six foot five, Travis Van Hoy, big fella. We had been calling this guy Boaz for a long time. Amy, this is your Boaz. Uh, we've been praying for Boaz. We didn't know Boaz's name was Travis Van Hoy. But Travis asked for Amy's hand in marriage, and Amy was almost 30 years old. She had been waiting and waiting and waiting, and God brought this man into her life, a godly man. And so he said, I want to ask Amy to marry me. Uh, do I have your blessing? I said, you have my blessing, godly guy. And then he had Debbie and me come to Houston for the big event. And he had it all set up, and there was candles, and there were rose petals, and he had the camera set up and everything. And then he went to get Amy, and Debbie and I are waiting in the wings, you know. And he went to get Amy, and then he was going to bring her back there. And while he was gone, a monsoon came through, blew everything down. Debbie and I are trying to put it all back. I didn't get it quite right. But he got down on one knee to ask Debbie... Uh, to ask Debbie, to ask Amy. That would really, he wouldn't be a godly man. We wouldn't be friends today. But big Travis got down on his knee to ask my daughter Amy to marry him. And he had this sign that he made, want to be a Van Hoy. They have that in their house today, want to be a Van Hoy. Do you want to be mine and she said, yes, I want to be yours. I want to be called by your name. That's what the Lord says to you and me. Hey, you, you want to be mine? Will you come to me in repentance and faith? I'll wrap my arms of love around you as the, prodigal, as the father did to the prodigal son. I'll put a robe on your back, a ring on your finger, shoes on your feet. We'll throw the biggest party you've ever seen if you'll come to me. Are you called by his name? Have you responded to his invitation to save you? The promise is for you and your children, as Peter said, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And I love that verse of the song. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Hey, do we need to change as believers how we're communicating, how we're carrying the name? Has God convicted you as he's convicted me? Yes, yes. We do, but we don't do it by gritting our teeth and trying harder. We do it by trusting more. Oh, for grace to trust him more. And if you're here and you've never said yes to the Lord's invitation to come to him, to be saved and forgiven, you can today. And let me just say this with all my heart. Any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, anybody, anywhere who would reject or neglect the Lord's offer to save them and set them free 
and make them a child of God is a fool beyond comprehension. There is a day coming when God will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And as Peter said, uh, flee from this perverse generation. As John the Baptist, uh, flee from the wrath that is to come. We don't know when that's coming, but it is coming. As sure as God's Word is true, and it is true, the wrath is coming. And there's only one place of safety. There's only one ark of safety, and His name is Jesus, and the door to the ark is open. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can today, and He will save you and change you forever. Amen. My friend, we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We are sinners before God. That's why Jesus came. He came to pay the price for our sin. He came to be our Savior. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, He will save you now and forever. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life, my heart, my all to you. Forgive me, cleanse me, save me, come to live inside me, change my life. And I promise to follow you all the days that you give me. In Jesus' name. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. If you just prayed that prayer with me, please let us know. The contact information is there. We want to pray with you and help you any way we can. Listen, you're important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.